Um, so today I want to talk about performance. Um, and I want to sort of share some stories and talk about some experiences that we here at Jane Street came across while trying to build high performance, low latency uh, applications. And these are the kind of systems that try to kind of get as close as possible to machine level capabilities as you kind of can and kind of try to squeeze as much out of a machine as you can. Um, so it's, this talk is kind of a survey talk of a, of a bunch of different techniques and in various areas that we found helpful. Um, it's worth saying that I'm not the expert in every detail of this talk. Um, so this is kind of a presentation of a collection of work done by multiple people here at Jane Street. It's also worth saying, um, or worth talking a little bit about how Jane Street thinks about performance before going into the talk about performance. Um, kind of Jane Street doesn't really think our primary value add or kind of core business is around optimizing purely for speed or trying to be the fastest uh, out there. But as the world gets faster and kind of thicker, meaning you get sent more data on bigger pipes in less time, often the only way to stay competitive or operational is to kind of become faster as well. Um, so this talk is about performance, and there's a lot you can say about when you talk about performance. So I want to frame this talk a little bit more, and I want to start out by saying kind of what this talk is not about. Um, so this talk isn't about sort of choosing efficient algorithms or kind of picking or optimizing your hardware that you run your um, uh, program on. Um, obviously, these two things are important if you're trying to build a real-world um, uh, high-performance uh, application, but I'm not going to go into much detail about these two. Um, similarly, I'm not going to talk much about exploiting parallelism. Again, if you're building a system with performance uh, requirements like this, you have to think carefully about the distribution of work between different aspects or different parts of your system. But again, I don't want to talk much about it today. And finally, maybe somewhat surprisingly, I don't actually want to talk much about the comparison of languages. It is clear that OCaml is the best programming language. Um, and this talk is also going to use OCaml as uh, sort of the language to like, explore, explore or discuss certain topics. But I hope that the talk is kind of more broader than that and sort of has applicable lessons in any programming language. And I'm not particularly interested in arguing that OCaml is the best language for this particular thing. I kind of more think of it as this talk is given a set of constraints, how do we achieve the thing? And the thing is being as fast as we can. And one of the constraints that we have to deal with is we're going to use OCaml. Um, I don't really want to, like, at the end, convince you and say, like, whenever you write performance-sensitive code, you have to do it in OCaml. I kind of mostly want to convince you that you can do it in OCaml. And if, if you're sort of using OCaml, then you can make this work. And it's not a reason not to use OCaml. Um, but I'm not trying to defend OCaml over any other performance language. OK, so now that I've kind of said what the talk is not about, let me kind of briefly state what the talk is about. Um, so this talk is kind of a case study of single core performance for a packet processing system in OCaml. So I think of this talk as given multiple constraints. For one, we're, doing sing we're operating on a single core. There's no parallelism. Um, we're trying to do packet processing, which, if you don't know, just means um, feeding packets, network packets, into a system, doing some non-trivial but not highly complex thing with the with those packets, with that data, and then shipping data out of the, of, the, of the box again. And finally, the constraint is we're going to use OCaml. So the talk is about, well, given these constraints, how can we make it work? How can we be as fast as possible? How can we kind of squeeze out every little bit of performance that the machine might give us? Um, it's worth saying that this is kind of a highly specialized application. And for many, many systems, including many systems that we build at Jane Street, the kind of we want performance over anything approach is often wrong. Um, but for this particular talk and this particular case study, we kind of want to say, no, we actually do want to get as fast as we can. And like, performance is the thing we care about most. Um, OK, so to briefly outline the talk, and um, I want to start out by talking about a motivation for the problem of like, what are we trying to solve? And also kind of doing a bit of an analysis to figure out what does fast mean? Like, how fast is fast enough? And how fast would be too slow? Right? Like, what kind of performance and what kind of latencies are we talking about? Then I very briefly want to talk about OCaml and some of the choices it makes on the programming spectrum. Again, I hope that this doesn't anchor you too much to OCaml. And in fact, most of these things also apply to other programming languages. And I think on, on, this, on, this, on the spectrum, kind of OCaml lands on a very similar spot in other languages, at least some other languages. 
Um, and then I want to talk a bit about some coding paradigms that you come across that have a performance impact and that you kind of have to change how you think about them when you're trying to do this high performance, low latency stuff. And finally, if there's time, I want to talk about some slightly bigger scope examples. Okay. Um, so to start out by motivating the problem, um, we here at JaneSeed have built and uh, are continuously building systems that uh, deal with what's called market data distribution. So you might say, oh, well, what's market data? So here's a brief overview of what market data is. Um, in the world of finance, which JaneSuit is in, I hope that's no surprise, um, the, sort of the main core thing is there's an exchange, and exchange allows you to trade things. And the main sort of function of an exchange is to keep what's called a book um, per stock. So this is sort of a, a trivial visualization of a book. And let's say, here sits the exchange, and we're interested in the sort of newly IPO'd and hip and cool Lyft company that uh, IPO'd a few weeks ago. Um, so the exchange's job is to maintain a, a book or a list of people's willingness to buy and sell this stock. Right? So here, there's a couple of people willing to, to currently buy uh, Lyft. Jane Street is here with a quantity of 1,000 of this price, and maybe Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs are here too. And on the other hand, people are willing to sell similarly on the side. So kind of the exchange, exchange's primary job is maintaining a data structure to keep this information and let people interact with this information. Right? So on the left-hand side, we have what's called the order entry side, which lets people, market participants like Jane Street, send orders into the exchange. Right? And on the other hand, we have uh, what's called the market data distribution. And this is kind of where we want to focus on. Um, this is the idea that, well, if Jane Street sends an order to the exchange, the exchange keeps it to it, adds it to his book. But then it also sort of broadcasts to the world saying, someone's willing to sell Lyft at this price. Um, sort of from an like, important finance aspect is that this part of stream is anonymized. So you don't, the world gets to know that someone is willing to sell, but the world doesn't get to know who. Um, it doesn't really matter from a technical perspective for us, though. Um, similarly, if then there's another uh, order that comes in that happens to kind of cross the book, well, the world gets to know a trade happened. Again, the world doesn't get to know exactly who traded with whom, but the world gets to know a trade happened. Okay, so this is roughly market data, and the problem we're concerned with is building systems that can efficiently handle market data distribution. So market data is kind of the fire hose of activity of everyone, everything everyone is, anyone is doing around the world on any exchange. So there's a lot of data, and it's clear that you have clients who very much care about this data. Primarily, you might have automated trading systems who make trading decisions in an automated way and send orders to exchanges based on this information, right? They sort of get this uh, sort of a feed of what's happening in the world, and they're, they're based their actions upon that. Um, so it's kind of bad if that feed is very, very slow or very inefficient because your automated trading systems will make bad decisions. There's lots of other systems like risk systems or monitoring systems or studies, uh, studies and historical tools. Um, but it's clear that all of these kind of care about an accurate and very efficient representation of this data. Um, so the problem we're kind of faced with is like, well, how do we deal with this fire hose and how do we distribute this fire hose efficiently to clients internally? Um, so I want to talk a bit more about some numbers, like what, what does this fire hose mean, how big is it, and how much data is there? So if we take NASDAQ, one of the biggest US equity exchanges, um, there's roughly a billion messages of these market data updates of like, here's a new order, or here's a new trade a day, and it peaks at something like three or four million messages uh, at the close, which is at 4 p.m. every day, which is traditionally the busiest time of trading. Um, there's not just NASDAQ, there's by now a dozen equity exchanges in the US. Um, there's lots more worldwide, and there's not just equity exchanges, but also lots of other derivative exchanges. Um, so it's clear that there's a lot of data to consume and kind of take in and feed to your, to your systems. So I want to get a, go a little bit further and look at some actual numbers to try and figure out what does this mean for us? Like, how fast do we actually have to be? But before I do so, I want to very briefly remind people in case some have forgotten on some like, terminology on latency. So here are some latency numbers. Um, there, we start at the very top with one picosecond, which is 10 to the negative 12 per second, which, according to Wikipedia, um, is the fastest switching time of a transistor. And then it goes from picoseconds to nanoseconds to microseconds and to milliseconds. And at the bottom here, we have 300 milliseconds, the blink of an eye. Um, so in the kind of... The area we're mostly going to concern ourselves with is nanoseconds and microseconds. That's kind of the area here that we'll be talking about most. Okay, um, so now I want to think again about, well, how fast do we have to be? Um, so let's look at a bit of data. Um, 
let's look at the following. Again, we're going to focus on NASDAQ, this big US equity exchange. And again, we're going to focus at the close, which is 4 p.m., which is the busiest time. Um, so now we're going to like, run the following experiment. Let's say we assume we process every message strictly sequentially. There's no parallelism. And let's assume that it takes us any of these times up here to process a single message. The question is, well, how long, how big does our queue ever get? What's the maximum queue size that we see in a 10 second window from this time backwards? So if you look at the first row, well, if you look at this particular row here, this tells us that if you can process messages at 750 nanoseconds per message, and we process all of them sequentially, um, the longest the queue ever gets from this timestamp, 10 seconds backwards, is 22 messages. Oh, that's some information. Um, so now if you look at the full data set, which includes this line, which is the most interesting, this is the actual close, um, we can see, I think, two kind of interesting phenomena. Um, one is the sort of very nonlinear growth here. Um, you can kind of see that, well, if it takes you 750 nanoseconds to process these messages, maybe things are still kind of reasonable. But as soon as it takes you longer, a microsecond or more, you're starting to buffer up a lot of messages. To the point that if it takes you 10 microseconds to process each message, um, you're kind of buffering a million messages in your uh, queue, which might mean you're just sort of buffering the full messages that you get at the close while you're still ch busy churning through the very first few that you saw. So this is kind of a very nonlinear uh, uh, growth you see here. And I think the other interesting factor that you see is um, the effect of falling behind, which is here. So you can see at this time, which is then after the close, which is usually a very, very quiet time of trading, not very many things trade after 4 p.m., um, most of these queue sizes have kind of normalized again, except this one, um, because it takes you, because you've queued all your messages at the exchange, uh, that the exchange sent you this time, you're still sort of busy churning through half of that thing that happened at 4. So now any message that comes in afterwards gets delayed by these sort of and backlogged. So this is the idea of falling behind when you're trying to build something that is real time, keeps up with messages, but can't and falls behind. Your messages will kind of experience very bad latencies. So if you look at this data slightly differently, and again think about um, per message processing time, but now look at the maximum delay that any message can experience in our system to, from the time it enters our system to the time it gets delivered to the client. We see a, sort of a very similar and confirming thing, that if you're, it takes you below 750 nanoseconds, things are fine. But if it takes you over a microsecond, you're kind of dead. You can't do that. Um, so the interesting bit is here. So if we scroll this up to the log scale, you kind of see this effect very much, um, which kind of points out and kind of concludes for us that, well, if you can build a system to, in the end, process things below 750 nanoseconds, you don't have to worry about it. Anything above a microsecond is not acceptable. Um, this kind of gives us a bound of where we have to land. So now we kind of have, have this in mind, and we know, well, this is the requirement we have. We have to be this fast. Um, but I briefly want to mention kind of two other requirements that I'm sure every software developer somewhere in his head has, but I think I want to motivate especially here, which is, well, we have to be fast and scalable. But specifically, we want to be flexible and maintainable. And this comes in, in this world from the fact that if you connect to lots of exchanges, well, it turns out they all speak different protocols. And they all have like, their own idiomatic ways of doing things. And some of them make sense, some of them make a little less sense. Um, but you kind of have to build against that protocol. Um, so what you want is you want to be able to keep any sort of exchange weirdness or specifics at the edges of your systems and the complexity of these things at the edges of your systems. So while you want to build a sort of very fast and scalable system, you also want to build it in a way that you can reuse a lot of code and then share, share things and only sort of do specific things at the edges. And similarly, you want it to be maintainable because exchanges change their protocol all the time. Sometimes there's a new exchange. Sometimes there's a, relation, a regulation that changes things. And you want to be able to act quickly on this as well. So you want to be able to kind of go in and make small uh, surgical changes quickly and safely. So the rest of the talk is kind of about, well, we have to be this. But well, we also want these two things. We really don't want to give these two things up. And so kind of how can we do that? And how can we, what kind of techniques do we have that we can achieve this with? By the way, feel free if you have any questions. Feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to answer them. Um, so, yep. Is there sort of, there's an implicit requirement in your earlier analysis that the process has content, correct? Right. 
So the question was, is the processing time constant? And in my early analysis, yes, it was. And I think we'll see a bit more later of where that assumption comes from. But I agree, that assumption was there. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you process a billion messages from NASDAQ. Are you doing all the billion, or like you cut down Oh, so the question is, if you cut down messages, um, you can, you can try to, um, but often the answer is, at the input of your system, there has to be a system that processes everything. And then, depending on the transport mechanisms you use to sort of shuffle out data to clients, hopefully the clients only subscribe to the subset they care about. But you'd probably have to have some system within your, uh, within your firm that kind of, it actually can keep the full fire hose. Cool. Um, Okay, so now that we kind of understand the system requirements and we understand what we're trying to do and how fast we're trying to be, um, I want to talk a bit about OCaml and kind of what OCaml means in this world. Um, so probably, as most of you know, um, OCaml is a functional language with a strong static type system, which means the usual functional programming things. You have higher order functions, you have immutability, and you have type inference. Um, and we really like these factors and these features. The higher order functions are like a very useful and cool way of structuring control flow in a way that makes the most sense to you. Um, OCaml also is, has some support for imperative primitives. Um, so you can do some procedural style coding, you can have some side effects, you can have mutability. Um, in fact, I've heard rumors that the uh, author of the OCaml language once called OCaml a imperative language with strong support for functional um, paradigms. So again, I guess it's a little bit between the two. Um, so on a sort of fundamental level, on the runtime, OCaml has kind of two things. There are things called immediates and everything else, which is a boxed value. And roughly the distinction is immediates are fast, and you can store them on the stack or on, in registers. And they're usually just ints. Um, or everything else that doesn't fit this criteria is a boxed value, which you store on the heap. And the kind of the dichotomy is just immediates are fast, and boxed values are quite slow. Um, similarly, OCaml has a generational incremental garbage collection, um, which maybe means something to you, maybe it doesn't. It indicates that, well, it's a memory managed language, so there's some garbage collector that takes care of it for you. You don't have to kind of free and allocate memory yourself. It does it generationally, meaning it has a first generation, and then if things survive that generation, it kind of gets promoted, which is similar to things, for example, like Java. And incremental means it kind of can do slice bits. But it does, it is a stop the world garbage collector, by the way, if you know what that means, that it kind of stops. If you have to do garbage collection, it stops your program, it does some, and then it resumes. There's no parallelism between the garbage collector and whatever you're trying to do. Um, right. And finally, OCaml has a way to interact with non-OCaml code through what's called the foreign function interface, especially C code, in a sort of a fast and very low overhead way. And we'll see in a bit why that might matter. Um, again, I want to stress that um, these things are might be, some of them are OCaml specific, but I think some of these choices are quite similar to other languages. And I think specifically the code that we will see that we have to write as a result of this is quite similar between OCaml and, for example, a language like Java. Um, in fact, I think NASDAQ itself is written in Java, and probably in a Java that's not this, that dissimilar from the OCaml we're going to be looking at. Okay, so let's look at some of these coding paradigms and um, think about performance in these ways. Um, so there's kind of two things I want to talk about. The first one is the problem of garbage. Um, so garbage is kind of defined as you create a temporary storage for a calculation. You store that calculation in there. And then you maybe use it again. But afterwards, you don't need it anymore. Right? So it's like memory allocated, and you don't need it anymore. And that's garbage. And at some point, the garbage creator is going to come along and take it away and sort of free it up. Um, and so if you look at a piece of code, some OCaml code, I hope no one is um, too afraid of some OCaml. I think it's pretty straightforward. You have some function that takes two arguments, and it maps over a list of this. One of the arguments is a list. It maps over it. And the function that applies it when mapping is multiplying every element by this multiplier. And then it maps again, and then it iterates over this list. Right? It's some fairly straightforward functional code. Nothing super exciting. So if you think about the sort of allocation behavior of this program, though, you can see some obvious and maybe some subtle problems. Um, again, I want to stress that for most of the applications you write, writing this code is just totally fine, and you don't have to think about allocation at all. But if you're trying to do this really, really low latency sensitive stuff, you have to kind of carefully think about this. Um, so one obvious source of garbage, of kind of unnecessary allocation for temporary storage to be thrown away, is this list.map. 
the way this works in OCaml is like it takes your list, which is a linked list usually, and it just kind of copies it. So now you have a list of length n, and now you're just going to create two copies here, which obviously creates only to be used once and then thrown away. So that creates a bunch of garbage. Um, there's also more subtle introductions of garbage here. Um, one is this function f. Um, I cleverly constructed to be um, a closure because this function, this value multiplier is not bound here, which means you kind of the OCaml runtime has to allocate a bit of memory to represent this. Right? This kind of an OCaml specific bit, but it it's kind of makes obvious that it's not always easy to spot where your program kind of allocates in this way. And another kind of subtle way of allocation is the fact that these are floats that I'm storing in this list might mean that if you reason about the allocation of this program, you might be surprised because floats have to be kind of stored in the OCaml runtime in a specific and kind of expensive way. So that goes to say, well, it's hard to reason about the allocation. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's hard to find the source of our allocation. Um, but you might sort of ask, well, why is this even a problem? Why is this slow? Why should I care about allocations? Um, and so the first thing is, well, the allocation itself isn't slow. Usually, the allocation is pretty fast. Like in fact, in OCaml, in the common case, the allocation is two or three assembly instructions. It's just a, um, uh, an increment and a check for overflow. That's it. So the allocation isn't the problem. That's fast. Um, so the obvious problem is, of course, well, the garbage collection is slow. Um, it's kind of the obvious trade-off you make. You don't have to worry about mem mem managing memory yourself. But every once in a while, you have to be, pay a sort of a cost of like, oh, now the garbage collector has to run and do a bunch of stuff. I can't do anything. And that is true, but it's not the only thing here. So if you assume that garbage collection is the only thing that's problematic for performance in this case, if you then think about performance kind of as a graph or as a distribution, you would assume that your average or your median is kind of unchanged. But every once in a while, um, your garbage collection tricks in, which causes the tails to look bad. Right? So the idea being, like, on average, you process messages, fine, no garbage collection, great. But every once in a while, you hit a garbage collection halfway through processing a message, and now the performance of that is really, really terrible. So the tails of your performance distribution look bad. Um, so it turns out this is true, but not the only factor. In fact, the median itself is also affected um, by this kind of garbagey programming. And the reason for that um, is a little more subtle, but it's to do with the fact how caches operate at operating systems level. Um, so if you remember, there is multiple, usually there's multiple layers of caches, level one, level two, level three cache. And the operating system is clever about pulling memory references into those caches to sort of hide uh, or mask latency going out to the main memory system from you. But, well, if you allocate a whole lot of stuff, it pulls all of this in a cache. But if you never use this thing again, only use it once, you kind of locality of these caches is very poor. Um, so you start, if you allocate a lot, and sort of throw it away quickly afterwards, you start to see a lot of cache misses. And you kind of pay for this price twice, because you once pay for it when you allocate, because when you allocate something that's quickly going to come garbage, it kicks something else out of the cache that might be useful. And then you pay again when the garbage collector runs, and it iterates over the, over the sort of live cells to figure out what to, allocate, what to collect. Because again, it's going to kick out a bunch of stuff that you cared about in the cache, and kind of make your cache locality bad. Right. So we kind of have these two main reasons, garbage collection itself and the, behavior, the effect on cache, caches as being a problem, problems. So now the question is, well, what do you do about it? Um, well, the answer is simple. If allocation is a problem, well, you just rewrite your code to not allocate, and then the problem go, kind of goes away. And this is usually what's called a zero alloc coding paradigm. And the idea here is you just write your code in a way that it doesn't allocate on the critical path. You can allocate anywhere else, on startup, on kind of error cases, or corner cases, you can allocate those, but you, can't, you shouldn't allocate on the, sort of the critical path of the hot path of your, uh, of your system. So the way you do this is you kind of keep flat and simple representations. Um, you don't use abstractions like you bind on an async deferred and a monad and, and all kinds of fancy stuff. You just, usually you have some I.O. buffer, you read some, some memory into this thing, you seek over the, 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 the I.O. buffer in the right places, you adjust some data structures, and you write something out, and that's it. So it's usually a very flat and simple hierarchy and representation of things. Um, similarly, you use, sometimes you use an external pool where you do your own explicit memory management um, instead of letting the, go, the, the uh, garbage collector do it for you. Um, this way, you can, kind of, you can allocate objects during the, um, uh, on the critical path, but you don't have to pay this price of the garbage collector. And this is why I mentioned the function for interface earlier of calling C code from OCaml. Because the way you do this, it turns out, is you like, call some C code in your program, and now this C code access memory 
that is outside of the control of the OCamelGarbage okay, collector. And then if you're clever about it, you can sort of lay out the, uh, the C structures you have to look like actual OCaml values, such that the OCaml runtime can read them and pretend they're OCaml values, but a garbage collector kind of never sees them. Um, you also adopt usually a synchronous workflow um, because it sort of makes things easier and there's no log contention overhead. Um, and you also use a technique called pre-allocation if you don't want to use this explicit mapping management. So if you step back, you might say, well, that sounds a little hacky, and that sounds a little, well, low level, perhaps. Um, and that's true, but I kind of want to stress that you really only have to do this in, in a small subset of your code, in the critical path of your code. The vast majority of your code still can use the garbage collector in sort of the richest and fat, um, nicest ways you can. You might also say, well, if you do like, stuff like this, why don't you just write the whole thing in C? And I know I, didn't, I said I don't want to compare languages that much, but here I go anyway. Um, I think you still get a bunch of nice benefits from using OCaml here. For example, you get the type system in a very expressive way that lets you kind of encode a lot of safety properties um, that you can't otherwise uh, encode, I think, as easily. And you, I think, also maintain a bunch more uh, memory safety than you do in other languages. Um, so while this might feel a little low level, I think it sort of strikes a balance between low level, but also gives you still a bunch of tools that you can use to maintain kind of code you like to maintain and look at. We'll see a bit more of this in the examples afterwards. OK, so one, one kind of thing I talked about is garbage and why it's a problem and how do you avoid it. So the second kind of paradigm I want to talk a little bit about is the idea of function calls. Um, so a function call, obviously, if you sort of compile it down, well, it's just an assembly, a jump instruction to some other piece in your code. Fine. Um, so you might say, well, why are function calls slow? Why, what's that, why is that a problem? And then you might remember some operating system class of like, oh, actually, uh, you have to preserve some registers. And um, uh, you might ha hit an instruction cache miss, right? So depending on your calling conversion, maybe you have to move some things around. Or maybe your like, instruction cache isn't perfect. Uh -huh. Maybe you, you get some misses there. Or maybe you like, have too many function, uh, function arguments, and then you spill over registers. And those are all like, problems and things to think about. But it also turns out that the um, sort of operating systems architects are usually very smart people. So these problems have kind of gone away, or at least become a lot less noticeable. Right? For example, branch prediction is usually pretty good. So you usually don't have to worry about it that much. And in fact, it's probably if you have sort of a function call in a tight for loop, you might be able to start to measure these and start to notice these being a problem. But in general, these things are not going to dominate your performance, probably. Um, but there's two sort of bigger points of why function calls can be a problematic thing. One is this problem of a closure allocation I mentioned earlier, where the runtime has to allocate extra memory to be able to represent your um, function call. And that kind of brings us back to the first problem of having too much garbage and too much allocation. But then there's also this problem of having fewer op compile optimizations. So the OCaml compiler, by default, is fairly simple in terms of optimizations that it does. And having a lot of function calls makes it even harder for the compiler to do anything clever. So now that we've kind of seen function calls and why they're a problem, what do we do about it? Well, we could resort to the, the thing we did in the other case and just never, call, never use a function call, just have one big procedural main function. But that would obviously be terrible, so we can't quite do that. Um, Instead, we're going to enlist a compiler for help. Um, so we're going to use a compiler optimization called inlining that tries to get around this problem. Um, so the compiler optimization, uh, inlining, it's kind of sounds a little deceitfully is simple, because the optimization is just, if you have some function here, g, that like, does some stuff, well, to, and in this example, I call it twice, once with true and once with false. The way you apply inlining is you kind of take the body of G and just paste it into the call sites. So um, instead of having this fun function of in G, you would just, in this immediate G true, kind of substitute the body with flag equal to true. Fine. And then you do it again down here. Um, so this is kind of a simple textual substitution of taking your code from one place and moving into the other. It's not quite that simple because maybe there's some mutability and state around. But in general, the idea is kind of this simple. And now if you look at the code down here on the right, well, for one, g is gone. And g, again, I cleverly wrote as a um, closure um, because of this arc over here. So there's no more closure allocation. Great. Um, and also, if you then look at this piece of code over here, well, 
there's some pretty obvious uh, optimizations that even the OCaml compiler could very naively and very quickly do. Right, so hooray. Um, now we've kind of gotten around this problem. We can use function calls everywhere in our code. Um, and then the compiler is going to come in and inline everything away. And it's going to be great and awesome and super, super fast. Um, it turns out it's sadly also not that simple. Because the sort of trickiest bit about getting inlining right, and this is what sort of the tools and compilers team at Jane Street, I think, spends most of its time on, is trying to come up with good heuristics about when to inline and when not to inline. Because it turns out when, if you just inline all the time, your program is going to be a lot slower than if you hadn't inlined at all. Um, so really, the, the, the trickiness here comes from when is it a good idea to inline and when is it beneficial to inline versus when is it not. Cool. Um, all right, so now we've kind of seen these two coding paradigms. We've seen function calls and we've seen inlining as these kind of two things to think about. Um, so now I want to talk about two sort of slightly bigger scope examples and see how things like this come up. Um, so the first one is the beloved option type. Um, I uh, used to give a separate talk about why the option type itself is such a useful feature and how any language that doesn't have something like this is just flawed inherently. Um, and the Haskell type uh, maybe is very similar. And sort of the very short argument of that talk is the idea that this gives you the type safety of avoiding null, po avoiding, avoiding null pointer exceptions entirely. Right? So in lots of languages, you can have a thing and some of some type, but oh, it can also be null. And you better remember to check it's null. And that's annoying and like source of countless bugs. Um, well, in this uh, language, uh, you kind of, with the option type, you explicitly um, state when a thing can be absent and when a thing is guaranteed to be present. Right? So if you have something of type T, then you know if it's of type T. It's not just T or null, it's T. Um, so this type is really, really useful and a really useful feature in, in languages. And I think it's becoming a lot more popular in languages that kind of don't have it and try to crawl it back somewhat. So if you look at a bit of code, that does some stuff. Um, it takes some arguments, and it tries to take in order and validate it against the market and see if, if it's OK. Um, well, it does some stuff, and it tries to find the most aggressive price currently in the book. And if there is none, it rejects the order. Otherwise, it kind of does a check and sends. Right. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, but of course, this find most aggressive price function returns an option, because there might not be any price in the book. Right? There might not be enough, anyone willing to buy or sell in the market currently. So you kind of have to specify what to do in that case. And now if you kind of squint a little and think about how you'd write that in Python, it's pretty obvious and pretty straightforward and would look very similar, except the fact that you probably have to remember that, well, the price you would get returned here might be null. And you probably have to have some like, if null, then this is otherwise not. And the problem here is, well, now you, the, the developer, had to think about that. And you had to be clever to remember to do so. And there's nothing in sort of inherently that rem reminded you to do this. Well, um, with, the, with the option type and the type system, there is no way to get the price out of um, the function return rather than destructing and matching on it, which kind of explicitly forces you to specify both things. If you omit this non case, the compiler is going to um, at least warn you of most of the time error out. Um, so this gives you the nice feature of kind of eradicating the possibility of a null pointer exception. Cool. Great. Awesome. Uh, except, well, if you benchmark the thing and if you kind of assume all these functions that I called here do nothing, well, it turns out if you do nothing, it's fast. It only takes four nanoseconds. But it allocates four bytes. Ah, that sucks. Um, if you do like a bit of the back of the envelope map, um, if you uh, take like four bytes per message, and if you're, trying, if you're setting your minor heap size in OCaml to something like 256 kilobytes, which I think um, is pretty normal, then um, you kind of have to run a GC every 64,000 me messages, which if you're trying to process million messages in a second, is, not that much. Um, so clearly this is a problem. And by the way, I should say the price itself, you can represent as an integer. So like the price itself is fast immediate. But still, the option yeah, makes, kind of makes you have to allocate. And that's frustrating. So what do you do to avoid this? Well, if you think a bit about it, you could probably come up with the same solution that we did. Um, you kind of take the, you build something what's called immediate option, where you take the um, universe of things, the universe of integers, you take one value out of that universe, universe and sort of say, oh, that value is now just none. Um, you can't use it anymore. And then the rest of the values are just sort of immediate integers. And then you put a little type for interface around it and use something like this. So that's pretty straightforward and avoids having to allocate. And who's going to have a price of min value anyway? No one. So, fine. Um, 
Right, so then if you rewrite the code, well, it looks a little bit like this. You still have this find most aggressive price. You reject if it's not there. Otherwise, you do your same checks. Right? So the code's pretty, pretty similar. And now if you benchmark it, hooray, no allocation. And you kind of succeeded and eliminate this allocation. Um, great. Except that it's kind of obviously a lie, or obviously a deceit. So I just kind of rave to you about how awesome this option type is, and how we've eradicated the null pointer exception forever, and how we laugh at other languages where you have to remember to, call, to check if the thing is null or not. Well, now we have to do it ourselves. Because kind of here, we have to kind of make sure we check is none. And, and, and if it's not, well, we can use this uncheck value function that gives us the, the value. But now, as a sort of reviewer, you have to scratch your hat and think, well, if this uncheck value function is here, is there actually always, is there always guaranteed to be safe? Is there somewhere where, where I have ever a check for is none in this case? Right. So we're kind of back into the world of null pointer exceptions and uh, kind of having to think about you, yourself as a developer having to remember to check for none, is none. So that's frustrating. Um, but it turns out you can play a trick to avoid this. Yeah. I just missed the allocation in the previous slide. Um, oh, sorry. I think it's not obvious, but it's just the, the, the way that the OCaml option type is imp implemented is um, using a box value, so you have to allocate for it. So um, by default, the OCaml option, like an integer, is you can just allocate, represent on the, on, the, on the stack, on a register. But as soon as anything is an option, you can't. That's it. Um, so it turns out you can play a little trick with syntax to avoid this. And um, in the end, your code's now going to look like something like this, which is exactly like it looked in the first slide, except there's a little percent optional. Um, and this percent optional is, well, well it's, um, it's PPX, but it's sort of more generally, it's a preprocessor that is applied before uh, the compiler compiles your code. And the preprocessor kind of takes this code you've written and expands it into something else that the compiler then does, kind of looks at. And the thing it expands to is kind of cool. It has um, sort of an if false branch where you take your efficient price immediate option and turn that back into a normal option. And then you match on it in a normal way with none and sum. And then in the if false, so in the true branch, in the else branch, uh, you kind of have the code that we had here, which is the fast and efficient way of doing it. And the sort of neat trick in this is that the type checker in OCaml runs before any dead code emulation. So you get your nice normal compil compilation errors. And if you omit the non-case, it's going to say, oh, you've omitted, it, omitted your non-case. You have to put something in there. But the code that runs at runtime is the fast and non-allocating version. So now we've kind of had this thing of we've wanted this type safety of option.t, um, but we also didn't want the allocation behavior. Um, so the way we kind of got there is and, and combine these two things is by playing a syntax trick on top of it. Right. So now I want to talk about one other example, which is slightly bigger, for which I want to look at this. Can you read this, or is it too small? Is it good, or was it too, it's too small? Well, mixed, mixed answers, so it's, it's too small. Oh, damn it. Well, I guess it's not too small. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, the kind of the, I think that the idea is pretty simple, and all the code details probably don't matter that much. Um, so, let's say we want to do something straightforward. We get some message from an exchange, and the message looks something like this. There's a bunch of identifiers, some symbols, and it also contains sort of a list of other things that has like some prices and a side to it. Fine. So these are like some arbitrary messages an exchange kind of sends to us as part of market data. And now let's say the thing we want to do is, well, we want to iterate over all these messages we get and iterate over all the book entries we have in them. And whenever we see a book entry that has the side set to, let's say, sell, we want to count up the, num the size we have. So at the end, we want to kind of want to know how much size there is in this total market data stream for selling. Let's say we want to do that. And I'm sure if you kind of uh, looked at this and like, spent 10 minutes writing some OCaml, you could kind of solve this problem. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. But it also, if you solve it in this no normal, naive way, it would perform terribly. And it would kind of perform terribly for two reasons. For one is, every time you get this new nice message from the exchange, you have to allocate this record type, which is similar to sort of a, a, a struct in C, 
which means you're going to allocate the whole ton of stuff. And you're not going to use very much of these things, but you're still going to allocate everything. So that's terrible. Um, and similarly, you kind of, not only do you allocate, you also parse way too eagerly. Right? So the message is going to come down on some binary format to you, and you're going to convert it into something like this, which means you're going to take a look at all the timestamps and parse all the timestamps out of this binary format, but you're never going to look at the timestamp. So that's a shame. Um, so you kind of you parsing too eagerly and you're allocating way too much for this to be efficient. Right? So what do you want to do instead? I think the, the actual thing you want to do is sort of take an IO, a buffer of I.O. where you can just write stuff in, have your network card write the packet into that buffer, seek to a few right places, adjust pointers, and you're done. Right? That's got much more straightforward and much simpler in the flat representation of how to do so. So let's see how we might want to do that. So we could do something like this, um, where we do a bunch of stuff. And uh, let's look at this. Oh, right. So we have like some I.O. buffer. And now we can write some interfaces that, well, if you want to get the uh, exchange identifier, well, we take the buffer and we seek to position 5 and we get the, uh, the int out. Fine. Oh, and if you want the sequence number, we go, of course, to position 13. Um, so you could do this. And this is now fast and efficient. But it's also terrible to, to read or write or exist. Um, so I don't know, if, if, if the protocol changes, I don't know how to adjust this number 13. I've never thought about it. I don't know what it means. Um, so clearly, this is not really maintainable or usable. But again, you can play a syntax trick if you have something that's fast and efficient, but kind of unmaintainable, or sort of doesn't have the properties about uh, safety that you want. Well, maybe you can play a syntax trick. In this case, you can, instead of writing this code or reading this code, you can just write something that writes this code for you. Right? And this is what we did with a library called Protogen, which is just a code generator where you specify in a little DSL kind of how your message looks like. And you specify kind of what, uh, what parts go in which order in, in this message. And then this library goes away and writes this code for you. And in fact, I never wrote this file I actually showed you. That's why I don't know where number 13 comes from. And um, I had sort of Protogen write this for me. Um, and now you kind of get the benefit of the thing is fast, and you don't have to actually maintain some horrible code. You still get to maintain pretty nice and easy code. So now to kind of prove to you this is not all wrong, I wrote a small benchmark where the code, I think, is a little bit too much um, here to fully read and understand. <coughs> but it, you can hopefully trust me that it kind of does the thing I said, hopefully. Um, and if you look at, so I've written two implementations, one using the simple types that I had defined, and one using the efficient types that I had defined. And if you look at them now, they don't look that different, these implementations. Right? The implementation here doesn't look a lot worse. Um, but then if you look at the benchmarks, you can kind of very clearly see an effect here. Um, you can see that the efficient processing of message takes 700 nanoseconds, admittedly on, on this laptop here, so it's not the, the world's best technology. Um, but the efficient world is quite fast, while the uh, simple implementation is with five, mi um, so with five microseconds is quite slow. Right? And again, you can see here these are minor word allocations per run, so you can see that this thing doesn't allocate, but this thing does. So we can see that this has sort of efficiently uh, sped things up for us. But another, I think, interesting point and sort of a more meta point here is that if I had shown you this slide at the very beginning of this talk, you might have said, well, sure, like you've speed, sped things up by like a factor of eight. But you also had to write like some library to generate code for you in a DSL and all this nonsense. Is that really worth it? And the answer to that in general is very, I find very hard, very tricky to reason about. But in this case, it's kind of clear. Because of the an analysis that we did earlier, we kind of know that, well, five microseconds is just not acceptable. It's just way too slow. Um, so I think as a meta point, this kind of, doing this kind of precise analysis early to figure out what numbers you actually need for your system to be acceptably fast helps you guide, make these performance optimization choices later on. Because it is always a trade-off between writing faster code, but also spending more developer time on maintaining or coming up with it. Right. So, to wrap up, um, one last thing to say is um, you, we have written your application, and it's kind of now super fast, and you've written it in all the right ways, and it sort of doesn't allocate in the right places, and then the compiler has inlined all the right things for you, and it's, it's awesome. And now you go and try and run it for the first time somewhere in production and see that it's obviously super fast. And then it turns out it's not fast at all. It's super slow. And now you kind of enter a fun third world that we're not going to talk about, but I find very fun to think about, which is kind of the world of deployment. And these sort of tricks you can play here to be fast. For example, you might figure out that, well, if all your application does is like read these packets, do a bit of uh, analysis on them, and then write them out again, maybe the majority of time it spends 
is in the operating system stack and not your program. So maybe you want to do something to improve on that. Or you run into this sort of fun fact, which is they call the cold hardware tax, where you have this phenomenon of if you make a system do very little, it's very slow. But then if you make the same system do a lot, it's a lot faster at doing so. And only sometimes you control that. Sometimes you don't control exactly um, how much your system does or how much a system that you talk to does. Right? So you kind of have to reason about how to, to avoid the cold hardware where you can, the cold hardware tax. And there's a myriad of other things you can tweak. You can think about network topology and affination to cores and all kinds of other fun stuff that are really, really important in getting your system to run fast, but we don't kind of talk about today. So instead, I kind of want to wrap up and talk about a few takeaways that we had from kind of trying to do this and exploring this. The first one, I think I already said, but it's very important to understand your requirements. And it's very important to upfront be very clear about what is fast and what is slow, and where do I draw the line, right? It's kind of almost impossible to make these decisions afterwards if you don't exactly know what numbers you're aiming for. Um, you also kind of have to understand your language. Again, uh, you don't have to use OCaml, of course. You, I encourage you to, but you don't have to. Um, but you still, whatever language you choose, you kind of have to understand carefully how this, uh, this language translates to um, machine code, how, it, how its runtime operates, and such things. And you also have to understand the machine itself that it runs on. And um, another thing I didn't talk about at all is you have to understand the tools to poke at the system that you vote or measure the system. So it is surprisingly, f surprisingly easy to um, benchmark the wrong thing and be confident about the conclusions you have of it. And then only later to realize the benchmarks are nonsense. Um, so actually getting a good and precise benchmark or so performance analysis out of your system isn't trivial either. Um, I think separately, if you want to build a system like this, it is kind of impossible to take a big complex system and say, oh, let's make it fast. And it's just about possible to do the opposite of take a system that does nothing and make sure it's fast at doing nothing. And then kind of iteratively add, a add features to it. And every time you do, you kind of make sure it still is as fast as you want it to be. And this kind of goes to say, you have to consider the performance in your system from the very beginning and not sort of as a later add-on feature to it. Um, to be able to do this, you also need to measure constantly. Most of these things that I talked about are kind of fragile things that might change the next time you change the OCaml compiler or the runtime version. So you have to have good regression checks and benchmarks in place to make sure you catch these kinds of things. And finally, I think the sort of maybe to us slightly surprising takeaway is you can do this and you can kind of hit these performance goals of being below a microsecond with using kind of standard and safe programming languages. And we don't have to all resort to kind of writing assembly code as we originally had feared. In fact, you can do this with a sort of standard language or at least a high level language like OCaml. Cool. Oh, I think this is all the questions I had. Um, sorry, this is all the things I had. Does anyone have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, how synchronous is the system? Um, usually very synchronous. Um, so I think the systems, at least that I've seen or touched, is, are mostly operate in this way that you have this, this packet, you read it in, you operate on it. And until you're kind of done with it, you do nothing else. And doing that kind of puts you in a peculiar spot because now you have to operate at line rate. Like if you're at any point slow, everything's going to be slow, right? But at the same time, it gives you a bunch of sort of high level qualities or, or bigger sort of abilities because you can reuse existing things. So traditionally, in this example I showed, you, use the, you don't allocate new buffers every time a message comes in. You have one buffer, you read into it, and you, you process your message, you're done and then you use the same buffer again. And being synchronous kind of means that that is safe to do. But if you're asynchronous, you have to think about, oh, but maybe someone else will reuse my mutable state later while I'm not yet done with it, kind of thing. But you did, all right, the, the, you're, you're doing this for trades and for, for messages? Yeah. Some, some of the messages aren't, aren't, uh, um, aren't dependent, so you can actually have asynchronous processes that have their own buffers. Um, I agree, but I think, I think, for, well, for one is sometimes the exchange just gives you one big fire hose and you don't have a choice. You have to have a system like this at the beginning who can process everything in one go. Um, and I agree, later on you want to fan out, but I still think there's something architecturally important of being able, at least able, to build a system that can sort of process the full rate without any parallelism. It, it just feels like you have multiple queues processing at the same time, the ones that are... Uh... I, I, agree, I, I agree you can do this. I'm not convinced that that solves your problem in a better way, but it might. But I think we should probably talk offline afterwards. <laughs>
Uh, do you use the same system of the cogent DSL to do IPC stuff with memory map files? Um, so let me unpack your question. You're saying, do we use the same system as um, code generation and interprocess communication in memory map files? It's a similar paradigm. As far as the example you're showing this for just in process allocating with the buffer, right? yep. I was wondering if it was kind of a similar idea for how you would communicate IPC or even with device drivers and things like that. So I think the answer is yes, at least to some extent. I think we've definitely ex experimented with sort of having multiple processes use sort of shared memory as a mechanism of, uh, of communicating in this way. Um, and I think we also experiment with all the sort of cleverness you can do with device drivers. Um, so yeah, I think the answer is yes, though I'm not entirely familiar with all the details. And then uh, the second question I had that was, I think a couple, couple talks ago, actually, the subject of GADTs came up as yep. a better way of representing and yep. touching the memory. Yep. Um, oh, yeah, excellent. Um, oh, yeah. So I kind of sidestepped this in this talk because um, uh, well, I didn't want to sort of introduce the whole notion of a JDT because it's a complex thing to talk about. Um, so what I did when, I, when we look, looked at this protogen DSL example I had, I kind of sidestepped an issue because as you said, oh, here's a message type. And it was just a product type, which you can like simply, very simply express in, in, uh, in a DSL. But if you want to do some types, like, you don't, like depending on the first byte of the message, maybe the rest of the message layout changes. Now you have to play some tricks with the type system to do so. And yeah, that's that. And I agree, you can use JDTs to do that. Yep. Is this like uh, still traversing the OS networking stack, or is it being injected earlier in the process and actually directly reading from the like native buffers? So, kind of the thing I presented is I think you can do both with. So we at JNC definitely do both too. Um, we definitely experience with like experiment with ways of bypassing the operating stack. Um, I think the code I just kind of showed, and the examples I showed, kind of just work through the normal operating system. But yeah, I think if you want to be faster in these worlds, you can also accelerate by kind of ignoring the operating system stack. Yep. So how do you guys do that on FPGAs? Oh, so the question is how, how have we, why we have we not done FPGAs or? Are you guys doing? Oh, are we guys doing FPGAs? Yes. Um, so why, why are we not talking so much on the software? Right, so this talk kind of focuses on performance on like a standard single core thing. And I think that gives you a lot of value. Um, though, and I think the talk's kind of meant to show that, well, you can get below a, a microsecond doing so. And you get, get, can, can get below a microsecond doing so without sort of giving up too many of the features you like. Um, but I think there's also kind of clearly a sort of bu uh, lower bound where if you want to be even faster than this, yes, you have to use FPGAs. And yes, at I have some FPGA engineers who experiment with that. Um, but it kind of forces you in a different framework too. I don't think, at least we at Jane Street don't know how to do all the things that you can do in this framework in FPGAs. You can use certainly FPGAs in like highly specialized applications things, but I don't think they solve the general problems of this. I agree in some cases they would. So yeah. So, so this doesn't generate RTL or anything like no. that. Like, no, it's, it's... So this, this, yeah, this does not run on FPGA, no. But um, some other things at Jane Street run on FPGAs. So this, sorry again. So this is a market data, right? So in the sense, if you're processing this in the software yeah. and you're doing something else on the, you know, on FPGAs, why are you crossing, you know, uh, back and crossing? forth to the FPGA? I don't think we're crossing. I think like these two, uh, two different systems with two different characteristics in different places. Oh, they are orthogonal. Yeah. In, okay. 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 Uh, yeah. What's your uh, instrumentation library? What are you using for it to get all these measures? Um, good question. Um, I don't have a good answer. Like in this case, we kind of did an analysis in the study, um, which I think the study itself was pretty easy because you can kind of subscribe to the Nasdaq stream and kind of like just in this case, you can build this like the, the original example I showed of the Q distribution. You can kind of just build a simulator, subscribe it to the, the real market data feed with the different Q sizes and see how big the Q gets. Um, so I, I'm afraid to say that there isn't a good general answer I have here. It's more of a, well, if you want to do this particular experiment, I can show you how. But I don't have a great answer to general tools. Sorry. Yep. Uh, given how much compiler work you guys do, is there some structural reason why you couldn't rework the variance system to, instead of kind of the hack you did with PPX for options, just fix it on the compiler level? Yeah, it's a good question. I think I've asked the same question. <laughs> 
Um, uh, right, it kind of feels a little frustrating to sort of work around with a preprocessor at a sort of around a fundamental limitation of the, of the runtime when you'd be, like to just be able to change the runtime. Um, I think the answer I got was like, it's not trivial to change the runtime. A, for like backwards and complexity reasons, and also I think B, the sort of memory representation and the way it interacts with um, the garbage collector tagging is not trivial. But I agree, it kind of feels a little intellectually frustrating to have to build something on top of it to make the underlying thing disappear when you could just fix the underlying thing. I agree. Um, you and then maybe you. Yep. Um, also, you mentioned that you have the privacy to use Ocaml. And you want, uh, of course, I, I also want, don't want to do the library comparison. Mm -hmm. But for GC, this uh, main characteristic, mm -hmm. uh, why don't you consider some, some else, something else that don't have a GC that to make the performance more predictable? Right. Um, so the question is, why do we use OCaml in these cases, especially on GCs, when we could use other languages? Um, I think that's a good question and a fair question. Um, but I think there's like a high, a high value in maintaining the same languages, the same language everywhere in your, in your uh, sort of workflow. So Jane we kind of use OCaml for everything, which means all the developers understand OCaml. All the developers use OCaml on a daily basis. All the tools are optimized for OCaml. So I think there's a pretty non-trivial cost in introducing another language to do a small, even if you do it in a small spectrum, um, which I think is the primary reason not to do it. Um, and I think originally when we started out, we were thinking, oh, hopefully we can make this work in OCaml. If we can't, maybe we'll have to do something like this. But I think with at least this talk is kind of trying to show that at least to some extent it works in OCaml. So we have it doing that. Yep. Uh, I, I think you mentioned about the inlining, that mm -hmm. there is someone that basically measures when it's worth and not worth, right? Do you know anything about, you know, do you guys build like models of, you know, computer architectures? Or is it just like benchmarking? Let me just tweak this, you know, run. I think it's, I think it's more the latter. It's more of an empirical study. I think it, there's, uh, yeah, I think it's mostly a benchmarking and empirical study of um, well, what does your performance look like um, if you uh, inline this thing versus if you don't, and then build a heuristic based on like the size of the function, or maybe you tag something in the in the code as being on the hot path, on the cold path, and then you inline by spec based on that. I think that is the the, the primary ways of arriving at these heuristics. Yeah. Does the OCaml compiler give you a mechanism to hint that you'd like something to be in line? Or? Yes, it does. Um, you can specify at a particular function point um, that you would like this to inline. And if it can't inline it, and for whatever reason, it'll give you a, an exception. Uh, sorry, sorry, a compiler like that, uh, one. Yes. You can say kind of, oh, this thing should be inlined. And it can kind of guarantee that or fail. Yeah, we do that, in, in, at least in these kinds of code paths, yes. Not on other code paths, but yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Thanks.